It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, and, and good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. As we head into the holiday season, Ontarians are stretching every single penny to try to provide for their families. When I talk with people, their frustrations are very clear. They're frustrated that they have a government that isn't putting their needs first on housing, on health care, or on the rising cost of living. They see a government captured by insiders, too mired in scandals and an RCMP criminal investigation speaker to help them. So to the Premier, people expect so much more from their government. When will he start to deliver for them? To reply, the government House Leader, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think it'll come as no surprise to the Leader of the Opposition that I look at things uh, a lot differently. I think uh, uh, when I look back at uh, this past year, I see uh, over 700,000 people that have a dignity of a job that didn't have that uh, before. I see billions of dollars worth of, uh, of investments that have come to the province of Ontario because of the policies of, uh, of this government, the policies that have reduced red tape, cut taxes. We are investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, to support, uh, to support the, uh, the investments that are, that are coming into this province. We're investing in transit, transportation. I look at our students, and for the first time, this Minister of Education has delivered peace in our school system, Mr. Speaker. And I say that uh, quite sincerely. Probably in the first time in my life, there is peace in our school system, Mr. Speaker. I look at the work that the Minister of Labour has done to ensure that we improve access to skilled trades. I look Spons. at the amount of women that are coming into the skilled trades. When I look back, I see a really good year, Mr. Speaker, and much to look forward to in the years ahead. Yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, after all the investigations and reports, even an ongoing RCMP criminal investigation, the government hasn't learned a single lesson and working people are no further ahead. A new report by the Auditor General a new report by the Auditor General that was just released leaves absolutely no doubt about the utter failure of this government to live up to the what they were elected to do on health care, on public infrastructure, on support for Northern Ontario. The auditor's repo report shows that people are being left behind while this government is being run out of the back rooms. So, Speaker, my question is again to the Premier. How many times does he have to get caught? How many policies will he have to reverse before he starts to put real people ahead of his own ambitions? Members, will please take their seats. And the government house leader. Uh, what we are doing across the province of Ontario is we're re rebuilding a health care system, thanks to the, the Minister of Health. We're rebuilding a health care system that was for far too long ignored by the previous Liberal government, which was supported by the NDP. We are building or renovating or upgrading over 50 hospitals in the province of Ontario. Despite the fact that we had a global economic and health care pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we are making historic investments in health care. We are seeing people come back into the health care system. But moreover than that, Mr. Speaker, we are making progress, significant progress, on our commitment to build 58,000 new and upgraded long-term care home beds which are homes for seniors. We're making progress on that. We are bringing economic development to parts of the province of Ontario that have never had it before. I look at the people in Loyalist Township who will have one of the largest investments ever made in their community, jobs and opportunity for them. Bonds. I look at the Minister of Northern Development, the Minister of Mines, the fact that we are opening up the resources of the North to support the investments that are coming in the South. Good news for all, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. Speaker, they can't repeal their bad decisions fast enough. Oh my gosh. In the last year, this government has spent more time flip-flopping on those bad policy decisions than anything else. The only thing that the Premier and his Cabinet have done in this last year is manufacture a housing crisis, a health care system Order. on its deathbed, and Order. a cost-of-living crisis Order. that has Ontarians on the brink. Order. What a shameful moment. It or, stop the call. Order. I couldn't hear the Leader of the Opposition. Order. 
The Associate Minister of Small Business will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. Restart the clock. The Leader of the Opposition still has some time. My goodness, uh, Speaker. Uh, let me repeat that. The only thing the Premier and his cabinet have gotten done in this last year is manufacturing a housing crisis, yes, a health care system that is on its deathbed, and a cost of living crisis that has Ontarians on the brink. What a shameful moment in Ontario's history that this Questions. Premier has put Order. us in and what for. His insider friends. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. I hope he will answer. Was it worth it? Order. Members, please take their seats. Order. Order. The Premier can respond. Well, well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I can't believe what's coming out of the uh, leader's mouth across the aisle about housing when the NDP and the Liberals and the Green have voted against every single housing initiative that we've ever put forward. And we, we, could go, we could go back five and a half years when people were leaving the province, 300,000 jobs were leaving. But the good news is, Mr. Speaker, we've created the climate and the conditions for 715,000 people to be working today that weren't working under their government. There's three, over 300,000 jobs available. We had over 800,000 immigrants show up to Ontario last year alone. That's what's crazy, causing the housing crisis. But do you know why they're coming here? This is the engine of Canada. This is the engine of North America. Everyone in North America knows we're the hottest place anywhere in North America to open a business, to start a family, to, to buy a home. That's what the real solution is by creating that environment. But thank you for the question from the Leader of the Opposition. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker. Speaker, since the 2022 election, this government has had to roll back almost all of its major policy initiatives because they got Order. caught rigging the system for their insiders. Now we have reports that show the dissolution of the Peel region is going to be another extremely costly boondoggle for the people of Brampton and Caledon and Mississauga. And as I pointed out yesterday, tax hikes as high as 256 per cent. Order. So to the Premier, are you going to reverse this decision too? Premier can reply. Sometimes I, I sit back and I, I look across the aisle and I'm thinking, how do these people get elected? No, I really ask myself, Order. how do they get elected? If their constituents actually were here and they saw how they vote, and they vote to make sure we Order. have the highest carbon tax, vote against every housing policy, vote Order. against the $184 billion of infrastructure, vote against all our great health care initiatives. They would never be voted. Matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, I know this is a little fantasy. Imagine if we stuck them in one part of the, the province and the rest, rest of us there. They'd go bankrupt. Yep. The businesses would leave. People would be moving out. They'd be having tent cities all around their, their little region there. Order. It'd be an absolute disaster. Order. And that's the reason, Mr. Speaker, Position they will order. never get elected to be running the government. I'm going to ask the opposition to come to order so that I can hear the responses. I think Opposition wants to hear them too. Supplementary question. Speaker, they're folding faster than a deck of cards over there. Just like the Green Belt grab, the decision to dissolve the Peel region was also rushed to advance the Premier's personal and political interests. While the people have caught on to this government's pattern of preferential treatment and decision making that puts their own interests over and over again ahead of real Ontarians. So I'm going to ask the Premier again, will he admit that the disillusion of Peel Region is a $1.3 billion political game? The government side will come to order. The government house leader can reply. 
I, I think uh, the, the questions from the Leader of the Opposition uh, really highlight the dramatic difference between the NDP and the Progressive Conservative Government. Mr. Speaker, she calls the investments that we've made in Windsor, historic investments in Windsor, she calls them a waste of time. Historic investments in Loyalists, she calls a waste of time. We have the largest investment probably in Canadian history in St. Thomas. Thousands of jobs coming to the province of Ontario. This is a leader who, in the last election, brought her, uh, her and her party's disagreement with the 413, an important piece of infrastructure to support the people of that region, voted against it. And the result of that, Mr. Speaker, the result of that was that the entire caucus that was elected from the NDP was wiped out and progressive conservatives replaced them. So we're going to double down. We're going to double down over the next year to improve on all of the things that we've brought forward the province of affordability, infrastructure, jobs, opportunity, a bigger, better, bolder Ontario. And the final supplementary. Well, I sure hope for the people of Peel Region that includes a reversal of that terrible policy decision. Because, Speaker, both the mayor of Brampton and the mayor of Caledon have spoken out against the dissolution of Peel Region. They, too, are calling for this government to reverse their decision because the reality is this backroom deal that was concocted by the Premier and the new Liberal leader have left people in Peel so distressed Order. about how this will impact their public services. Everything from garbage collection and sewers to children's programs and, in fact, shelter services. So back to the Premier of this province. Why should the people of Peel trust him when he has continued to use them as a pawn in his 4D chess game? And to reply, the Premier. M M Mr. Speaker, why would the people in Peel trust us? Well, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why they could trust us. People in Brampton, people in Brampton now, we've saved the Stellantis plant. The people in Brampton are now getting a university that they never had before to create more doctors into the system. The people in Mississauga, they're seeing the great Hazel McCallion line uh, right across, Order. right across uh, the Peel region. Order. They've seen tremendous growth they've never Order. seen Ottawa, before in, in Peel region. We're supporting them, making sure that they have more commercial, industrial, and housing for people in Peel. And I could go on and on, not to mention Trillium, that we're building the largest Ottawa, hospital South, come to order. in Canada, Trillium. We're Response. building the largest long-term care homes, I mean homes, yes, in Peel. So the list could go on and on and on. If I had a half an hour, I'd keep going, listing them all off. The great thing. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my constituent, Tracy Christopher, is Christopher is currently being evicted from her building that is getting demolished, forcing her out in the bitter cold this winter. Tracy pays $1,076 for a two-bedroom two apartment, but rental rates in the current market are about three times higher. Her son suffers from severe mental health issues, which, he, which has only deteriorated severely since the eviction notice. Despite relentless searching as a part-time PSW and single mother, Tracy is denied housing due to her low income. Some landlords even demanded the applicants earn $100,000 just to rent. This is the alarming reality of Ontario's housing crisis. Yes. Ontarians are unimaginably struggling right now due to the rising cost of living speaker. How is this government going to address this so that Tracy and others Question. don't end up on the street in this bitter cold winter? Thank you. Good. Respond, the Premier. No, oh, I, I, I really like your member from Scarborough. She's a very nice person, works hard. But why do you vote against Order. all our housing initiatives? Why? If you want people in Scarborough to have a better life, vote for our housing initiatives. You voted no every single time. You voted no against the subway Order. that the people wanted in Scarborough. They voted no for the new hospital that, for that Hamilton people wanted. They voted no to the long-term care homes. So please, I beg you, you're such a nice person. Start getting on side with the people of Scarborough and start supporting them. And start voting for the housing initiatives that we put forward. And the members to please make their comments through the chair. Order. The supplementary question. Spe Speaker, 
Tracy might lose her home and be on the streets. And I have another tenant uh, in that building who's, who might also be evicted. Karen Azuper shared that the, off, the offered rent gap compensation runs $1,000 low if we look at the current rental market. For a low-income renter like her, it's pretty much impossible to rent an apartment. Speaker, 32 units in that building in my riding, and I welcome the Premier to come and see what's happening, because these buildings are getting demolished, and these are the only affordable places people have left right now. So 32 units are being demolished, and all these families are asked to find new homes, while demands of the current housing markets are completely unreachable for these families. Is this government and the Premier going to prioritize Ontarians' desperate need for affordable homes, or are they too preoccupied with evading accountability in an ongoing RCMP Question. investigation right now. Thank you, Speaker. Members will please take their seats. Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think we'll agree on one thing, uh, uh, that there is a need to build more homes uh, faster across the province of Ontario and more homes at, uh, at all levels, including affordable housing. That is why we, we've uh, introduced legislation to uh, expand the definition of affordable housing and make it uh, consist not consistent, but allow each market to drive what affordable housing is. It is why we have, uh, I'm excited by the fact that we have 15,000 uh, the highest level of purpose-built rental starts in the history of, uh, of, this, uh, of this province. But more than that, Mr. Speaker, it is why I continuously am calling in this House for the federal government to come on board with us so that we can put more infrastructure in the ground. The federal government has a $15 billion program across the country right now, Mr. Speaker. That program is estimated to bring over about 200,000 homes online. $15 billion worth of infrastructure across this country would be Response. millions of homes. So I need the members' opposite support to help us get the federal government to make those investments in infrastructure so that we can build millions of homes so that there's more opportunities for the people of the province of Ontario. Mr. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, when the Liberals were in office, they actively implemented policies that were intended to cripple our auto sector. They knew the electrical vehicle, electric vehicle revolution was underway, but they didn't believe our auto sector could compete with China and other U.S. states. As a result, they looked on with the NDP as automakers and good-paying jobs fled our province. Thankfully, our government quickly reversed course as soon as we took office. We know Ontario has everything to be the leader in electric vehicle production, and that's why we have worked to secure more than $27 billion in EV investments over the past three years. Speaker, can the minister please highlight any recent auto investments that are strengthening Ontario's position Question. as a leader in electric vehicle production? Thank you. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, we are building an end-to-end -end electric vehicle supply chain here in Ontario. We're, we are certainly a complete difference from what we saw with the NDP-backed Liberals. We now have Dana in Cambridge investing $60 million, hiring 105 new people with $2.5 million in support. They are making uh, components for EV batteries and electronics. We have the Ontario Modernization the automotive modernization program. 26 Ontario companies are investing $10 million, 111 new jobs being created by those companies with $3.5 million in support. Speaker, with investment like these, we're making sure that Ontario continues to be the global leader in electric vehicle and parts productions. And the supplementary question. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's always great to hear about investments that are creating good-paying jobs across the province of Ontario. Under the previous Liberal government's watch, 300,000 manufacturing jobs left Ontario. Now the new Liberal leader wants to do it all over again. The Liberals and the NDP want to put up mountains of red tape, raise taxes and crush our manufacturing sector. Under our government's watch, that will never happen. By reducing costs for businesses and for workers, Ontario was once again a manufacturing powerhouse. Speaker, can the minister highlight any recent manufacturing investments that have created good-paying jobs in the province of Ontario? Thank you. 
Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation. Well, Speaker, the member is absolutely correct. Under the Liberal government, we lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Under our government, we created the climate for 700,000 jobs to return. And I will say that this year alone, 30,000 new manufacturing jobs were created in Ontario. That's 65 per cent of all manufacturing jobs that were created in the country. We are, as the Premier said earlier, the economic powerhouse. TNR Doors in Oromodonte, $40 million investment, 30 new jobs, $5 million in support from the province. German manufacturer PWO, $10 million investment in Kitchener, 27 new jobs, a million and a half dollar investment from, uh, uh, from the province of Ontario. Speaker, we will always support Response. Ontario's manufacturers, and that's why we are leading the EV revolution. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Well, thank you very much. Speaker, just days ago, Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown released new numbers that showed that this government's plan to dissolve Peel Region could cost local taxpayers an extra $1.3 billion over 10 years. This updated report noted that the added cost would require taxes to increase by 17 per cent in Mississauga, 34 per cent in Brampton, and 256 per cent in Caledon. This is the equivalent of a 38% one-time tax increase across the region. Speaker, the mayor himself says that they never asked for the region to appeal to be dissolved. Previous independent financial analysis clearly shows, this is a quote, the net result would be a financial disaster. It would result in the largest tax increase in Peel region's history. This is just another one of this government's billion-dollar boondoggles that will cost taxpayers and citizens. Can the Premier explain why, despite these numbers and the financial analysis, that all push his plan being a financial train wreck that he insists on pushing through with the dissolution of Peel Region? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I can, uh, I can assure the, the honourable member that uh, this government will not allow uh, any municipality to raise their taxes to a point where it is unaffordable to the people who are living there. Just the opposite, Speaker. What we are trying to do uh, across the province of Ontario is ensure that people have more money in their pockets. With respect to Peel, as you know, Speaker, uh, the transition uh, in Peel is not scheduled to take place until 2025, so that we can undertake a thorough review of what the consequences of any change. Uh, in Peel uh, region would be. And when there's more to say, I'll let the honourable member know. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. So we do know that this government is now contemplating another park in reverse on the dissolution of Peel. Uh, you'll remember that the Premier himself made this promise to the former mayor of Mississauga. In fact, he named the legislation after her, the Hazel McCallion Act. Uh, now we know that the government has seen the numbers, uh, perhaps for the first time, and are looking to reverse this decision. Uh, now, this is a pattern of this government. They lurch from crisis to crisis, from bad decision to bad decision. We saw the Greenbelt scandal and the forced reversal. Then all the MZOs came under fire, and now we have the potential for backtracking on the plan to split up Peel. Uh, actions have consequences, and they have costs. And, and this Premier, lurching from crisis to crisis, self-made crisis, I may add, is, is a costly endeavour for the people of this province. So my question is is to, this, is to the Premier, which promise was true, the one that he made to Mayor McCallion as she was dying, or the, or the decision to dissolve Order. Peel Region? It's a Order. 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 Is there a response? Order. The next question. Back to the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Minister of Northern Development. The carbon tax is making life more expensive for everyone, and especially, Speaker, for those living in Northern Ontario. Unlike other parts of the province, the North faces unique barriers when it comes to fuel costs. Clearly, neither the federal government nor the NDP or the Liberals understand, respect or care about its negative impact on individuals and families. In rural and remote areas in the north, running any kind of errand 
a trip to the grocery store, or attending a medical appointment can be a half day's drive or more away. Speaker, can the minister please explain more about the negative impact that increasing taxes, high interest rates, and burdensome red tape is having on the quality of life for the people of Northern Ontario? Thank you. Thank you Member for Thunder Bay, Atticokan and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brantford Brant for that question. Our government is working hard to make life more affordable for Ontarians, including Northerners like my constituents in Thunder Bay, Atticokan. We are taking action to help hardworking families keep more of their paychecks by keeping taxes low and uh, to make life more affordable, like removing our portion of the gasoline tax. We understand that Northerners are affected greatly by the carbon tax, and we echo the calls of governments of all stripes across the country and from groups like Chiefs of Ontario to scrap the carbon tax. Our government recognizes the enormous opportunities in the North in places like my riding of Thunder Bay Atacokan. We are taking action across the board to ensure that we are well positioned to capitalize on those opportunities. More than $288 million has been provided to, to, to improve the health, economic and social well-being of hardworking families in Thunder Bay, Atacokan in 2023 alone. We have made record investments in supportive, transitional and affordable housing, tripling the HPP funding for Thunder Bay DSAB. Mr. Speaker, response. we will continue to invest in the North because we recognize its potential and we will continue to fight to keep life more affordable. Thank you. Supplementary member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that response. Speaker, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, drove jobs out of our province and failed to unlock Ontario's full economic potential. As a result, many opportunities were lost to foster economic growth across northern Ontario because of high taxes and burdensome red tape. In contrast, our government recognizes the value and potential that are present in rural, remote and Indigenous communities. However, the sad reality is, is that businesses and community organizations are struggling because of the negative impacts of the carbon tax. That is why our government must focus on addressing opportunities that will advance prosperity in northern communities, create jobs and contribute to the overall quality of life. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain how our government is building a stronger Question. province by supporting northern Ontario? Thank you. Member for Thunder Bay, Atticoke. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of our government's commitment to Northern Ontario, including my riding of Thunder Bay, Atticoke. While members of the opposition question the value of the numerous visits, minister's visits to Thunder Bay, our government knows that given the complexity of issues in communities where previous government approaches have been ineffective, unmeasured, and lacked credible vision, our community engagement enables better understanding of our needs and aspirations thereby leading to more desired outcomes and driving social capital transformation. This mindset has enabled increased awareness of our community's capacity to advance solutions in building resilience and, moreover, stimulated how we may tap into the underutilized potential of our people and our natural resources. Overwhelmingly, I'm hearing from my constituents at roundtables and out in the Response. community that affordability and inflation is a top issue. I've heard members of the opposition state several times during QP and debate they don't understand. Well, Mr. Speaker, fortunately, this government has a deep understanding of what Ontarians need, and we will continue to get it done for them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government has fast-tracked three important bills at once, limiting debate and excluding the public. The Luxury Spa Act has flown through, making sure the minister gets her legacy mega spa, the power to issue fast pass MZOs, and all this with impunity while they wreck Ontario Place. No one trusts anything this government is doing, and why should they? In her recent Empire Club speech, the Minister of Infrastructure referred to the CEO of Infrastructure Ontario as her, quote, partner in crime. It is a weird thing to say, Speaker, especially when they are literally passing legislation to put themselves above the law and when this government is under active criminal investigation by the RCMP. So I want to know, who does this minister think she is and why does she think she's above the law? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I enjoyed myself at the Empire Club yesterday. We had close to 400 people attending in person and Order. thousands of people viewing our government's update on our P3 pipeline, which is $185 billion worth of investment. It was an important day for the Ministry of Infrastructure, and it was a really important day for Infrastructure Ontario, who helps us execute all of those contracts for the most complicated projects in the province. We're talking transit. Young North. We're talking hospital expansions, highway expansions, Mr. Speaker. But you're right. We've had a very successful fall session. We stroke. Uh, we have a deal with the City of Toronto in Order. terms of making sure we provide supports for operational Order. funding for the TTC to keep riders on the TTC safe, for more trains on the TTC, Spons. and of course a brand new science centre at Ontario Place. Three supplementary question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you to the uh, Minister of Infrastructure. I don't know why you call it a, a successful fall, fall session when you've had to repeal the Greenbelt Act. You may have to repeal the, the appeal uh, dissolution as well. But we have advocates in the House today who are strong advocates for, the, uh, for Ontario Place. And they are deeply concerned about the project's environmental destruction, the waste of hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. And it's even more alarming now that the government has passed the Luxury Spa Act, which allows the minister to commit misfeasance, breach of trust, breach of fiduciary obligation, and to act in bad faith. <laughs> On the same day that the Conservative government jammed through the bill with no public hearings, no amendments, and no third-party, third-reading debate, the Minister of Infrastructure appeared at the Empire Club and introduced the CEO of Infrastructure Ontario as her partner in crime. To the minister, what laws has she wow. broken or is she planning to break which made it necessary to pass the Extreme Luxury Spa Act? Well. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I'd like to say is just my, express my complete gratitude to Michael Lindsay, who is the president and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the last five years, whether it was to negotiate and work with the Minister of Transportation at the time, negotiate the subway expansion plan deal, again, great benefit to the GTA and the City of Toronto, and then when he came on board as the president and CEO of Infrastructure Ontario and I, the Minister of Infrastructure. Order. I've had a very productive relationship, working relationship with him. But Mr. Speaker, when we're talking about the work that has been done at Ontario Place from an environmental perspective, we've completed two environmental assessments, one Class C. We've completed over 40 different studies. An arborist report, a heritage impact assessment, Response. a stormwater report, Mr. Speaker, all in compliance with the City of Toronto development application process. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. I cannot stress enough how importantly my riding needs solutions for access to primary care. Multiple groups of healthcare care professionals have responded to the Minister's call for interest and submitted proposals to open more primary care clinics in Ottawa Vanier. That was six months ago, and people feel abandoned as they remain without proper health care services. Yet, there is no response from the ministry. Speaker, I showed the minister a map showing the void that exists in my writing when it comes to health care services. I've also written providing evidence as to the need for help to fill that void in Ottawa Vanier. We have professionals ready to help relieve the strain on our local hospital. All they need is for this government to step up. Can the minister please tell these health care professionals Question. when they can expect a response so they can get to work providing much-needed health care services to the people of Ottawa Vanier. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, while well, I'm pleased that the Liberal member is finally interested in expanding primary care because, respectfully, this is the first expansion of primary Order. care teams since Order. multi- disciplinary primary care teams were formed in the province of Ontario. So clearly, there is a great deal of interest, and the member is right. We have had in, uh, expression of interest, proposals come in from literally across Ontario, hundreds of proposals that we are now assessing, reviewing, making sure that the investments we have committed to through Order. 
our budget and the member opposite and the other members of the NDP and the Liberals voted against is Order. going to happen in this term under our leadership. Thank you. The supplementary question. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, health is not a question or a medical question. There are several factors that have an impact on the people's health, especially our children. The Vanier Social Pediatric Hub, with its multidisciplinary team, serves the children and the vulnerable youth, offering them some support and support that they need for their physical, mental, social, emotional needs. And also, uh, we offer uh, French serv uh, language services from uh, small children to adults. And that's uh, uh, enough to uh, respond to their needs in mental uh, health. Those two organizations certainly need a new financing that will offer an offer for services. And when does Ottawa will see such an undertaking of, from the government to support uh, organizations like Carrefour de Pédiatrie Sociale that give essential services? to do in particular as pediatrics you know you will remember last year we had the triple threat with pediatrics with COVID-19 with RSV and with the flu season all impacting our pediatric hospitals at the same time what did we do speaker we invested 330 million dollars in pediatric funding in the province of Ontario and the Ottawa Hospital, CHEO, has actually reached out and communicated how those investments have already made a difference. They are seeing the same number of patients as they saw last year. The difference, Speaker, there is no decrease in the uh, surgeries and access in the emergency department for our most vulnerable pediatric patients is happening on the ground. Those are the investments that are making a difference in Ottawa Response. and across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Oh. The forestry industry is a major driver of our economy and generates billions in revenue every year. And if it wasn't for the Ontario forestry industry, we wouldn't be able to build the 1.5 million homes that we need over the next decade. The forestry industry in Ontario is one of the biggest drivers in our housing industry. With an abundant supply of forest biomass products in our province, it is of critical importance that we support this emerging industry and its innovators. Our government must continue to explore all options to address untapped economic growth in the North and unlock the full benefits from Ontario's biomass potential. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is doing everything we can to support job growth, attract investment, and secure the long-term future of our forest industry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question and the great work he does for his constituents every day. <laughs> Speaker, I was in the great riding of uh, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke on Friday with the great member from that area. And if anyone saw the pictures, we were standing in front of a giant pile of wood chips. We are Laverne Heidemann and Sons, uh, a great mill operator in the Eganville area, and that was to announce multiple projects being supported by our biomass action plan. Mm. Uh, also in the valley, Ben Hokum and Sons receiving dollars, Roseburg Forest Products receiving dollars, but companies all throughout Ontario receiving dollars through this program to make sure that we are growing the forestry industry and the forestry sector. We're looking towards the future, Mr. Speaker, of what forestry can be. The previous government didn't know what to do with the forestry industry. We know exactly what to do with it. Grow it, create jobs, use biomass as a future to make chemicals, other things that we need, energy here in Ontario, fertilizer projects, the potential of biomass is unlimited, and these projects and these investments will support Response. the forestry sector, support our forest sector strategy. We know that forestry is important in Ontario. We're moving forward. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. 
It's reassuring to hear that our government is working to put the forest sector at the forefront of new economic opportunities. Under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, the valuable contribution of Ontario's forest was neglected. They actually referred to the North as no man's land. Uh. They wasted billions of dollars between scandals and called it a wasteland. Shame. Unlike the previous Liberal NDP coalition, our government continues to secure forestry jobs across the North and drive the industry towards sustainable growth. Speaker, can the minister please share what our government is doing to support a strong forestry sector for future generations? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you again, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. And it certainly isn't a wasteland or a no man's land. It is a land of opportunity in Northern Ontario, and this government recognizes that opportunity. This government is creating jobs and opportunities in Northern Ontario, and I'm very, very excited about that, Mr. Speaker. One of those opportunities is working with an Indigenous-led company called Infinite Carbon Corporation, and they said they're committed to sustainability. Infinite Carbon is immensely grateful for the essential support from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. The the funding through our Biomass Action Plan has been key in laying the necessary groundwork for meaningful ecological change within our forest sector. Speaker, we do not want to find solutions elsewhere for the challenges we have in Ontario. We want to Spots. use our forestry sector to continue to grow Northern Ontario. Again, previous governments didn't know what to do with the forestry sector. We know exactly what to do with the forestry sector. Grow it every single day. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catherine. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. After Niagara has lost access to two of, it, to two of their urgent care centres after 8 p.m., I looked at the ER wait times at St. Catherine's General, and it was five hours, the longest wait times across all Niagara, Hamilton, and Brant. With Niagara's significant senior population, chronic conditions, doctor shortages, and staff crises worsening by Bill 124, it is deeply problematic to see continual defence of regional services cut, cuts reported by the Ontario Health Coalition. Minister, you hold the purse strings to, the, to adequately fund hospitals. Why not put a stop to these closures and increase funding to hospitals for the seniors in Niagara that need them the most right now? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Just a, a gentle reminder to the member opposite that, in fact, uh, hospital-based budgets were increased by an average of 4% in our last budget. Um, we invested $44 million in every single hospital. This is unheard of, never happened before. We invested $44 million to make sure that those hospitals, including smaller hospitals across Ontario, had sufficient resources to ensure that their emergency departments remained open. We have invested in our paramedic Order. services with dedicated offload nursing programs that ensure paramedics can quickly be able to transfer their patients to a, a, a nurse, a respiratory uh, therapist or a paramedic who is stationed in the emergency department to Response. make sure that those paramedics get back out into community quickly. We have so many programs that have made an impact in, the, in uh, hospitals across Ontario, and we will continue to work with our hospital partners. The supplementary question, the mem member for Ottawa West and PN. Speaker, let's talk about the minister's record. There have been 20 emergency room closures in eastern Ontario so far this year, some of them for multiple days. Every time this happens, it means chaos and long drives for patients in need of urgent care, and it means longer wait times for Ottawa emergency rooms, contributing to offload delays for paramedics in Ottawa and over 1,400 level zeros for Ottawa ambulances this year alone. Why is the Minister of Health breaking our public health care system with no regard to the patients who are paying the price? Yeah, 
Well, respectfully, I'm not sure how you can say an $80 billion annual investment is breaking anything other than ensuring that we have a robust public health system in the province of Ontario. You know, 50 new capital builds, including South Niagara, of course. So we are talking about investing not only in people, but in the, the infrastructure that they need. 49 new MRI machines since our government was elected in 2018. What does that mean, Speaker? It means that people who had to wait who had to be transferred to other hospitals now have an MRI machine in their community and allows those physicians to get that diagnostic piece that is so important to make sure that we have health care close to home. We'll continue to make those investments, and unfortunately, if your history is any indication, you will continue to vote against it. I remind the members to make their comments through the floor. The next question, the member for Orleans. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, everyone, and, and Merry Christmas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Christmas is, of course, the season of love and hope. And last week, the Premier professed his hope for Toronto, the city he grew up in the, and the city he loves. Well, Mr. Speaker, I grew up in Ottawa, and I love my city. And our city has problems just like Toronto. We have problems with homelessness. We have problems with transportation. We have problems uh, with our city running deficits. So, Mr. Speaker, in, in, in recognition of the, the season of love and hope, when will this government show some love for the City of Ottawa? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, well, thank, you, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can uh, uh, assure the honourable, uh, honourable Member that I've actually been uh, meeting with uh, the Mayor of uh, Ottawa on a weekly basis uh, uh, since I became uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and uh, we are working with him to address some of the challenges uh, that he is uh, indeed facing uh, uh, in, the, in the City of Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. So I can assure the Honourable Member that we are working very closely with the Mayor and his team uh, to address some of those, uh, those challenges that they're facing. Supplementary question. Well, I appreciate uh, that, Mr. Speaker. Of course, one of the major concerns in the City of Ottawa is the cost of Highway 174. Since being downloaded by the province, this highway, this regional, trans-jurisdictional, urban expressway has cost taxpayers tens and tens of millions of dollars. It has been the political promise of every party in the South, except for the NDP, because as we know, they're against everything, to upload Highway 174 back to provincial responsibility. Now that, the, now that there is a precedent to upload highways to the province, will the government commit to uploading Highway 174 back to provincial responsibility so the city can spend that money improving local roads, investing in public transit, and reducing commute times for Orleans residents? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I, let me just defend my colleagues in the NDP against that vicious attack uh, by, uh, by the member of the, of the Liberal Party. Uh, uh, they're not just against everything now, they've been consistently against everything, right? So, uh, but, but let me just say this, uh, I'm working very closely with the Mayor of Ottawa, with, also with the, uh, the members of uh, provincial parliament uh, from, that, uh, from that area. Uh, uh, on, uh, on, on our side, Mr. Speaker, we are meeting very closely with them. We're identifying some of the challenges uh, that they're having. We'll continue those discussions with them, uh, uh, Speaker, uh, and we will make sure that we continue to uh, support the City of Ottawa. We know how important it is uh, uh, not only to Ontario's economy, but it is an important, a very, very important uh, tourist jurisdiction. I, I uh, had the opportunity to live in Ottawa for a number of years, Mr. Speaker. It's an important university Bonds. town. Uh, it is so important to the economic development and growth to build a bigger, better, bolder, stronger Ontario. We need Ottawa, and we'll make sure that we're there for them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Doing great. Just recently, many of my constituents from Burlington joined fans from across the country to watch Canada's biggest sporting and cultural event. This year's Great Cup did not disappoint, including the lively festivities following the game. Multiple outlets have reported it was a Great Cup for the ages. 
The Great Cup is more than just a football game. It plays a critical role in fueling Hamilton's local economy and tourism sector, drawing over 28,000 people in attendance. Wow. Speaker, can the minister please share how events like the Grey Cup unite communities and bring Ontario economic prosperity? The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question and for all the work that she does and her friendship. And I'd also like to wish this, everyone a, a healthy and happy New Year and holiday season. And a Christmas, by the way. Uh, this year's 110th Great Cup, and no, Mr. Speaker, I have not been around for all of them, uh, was a, a week-long experience. Uh, yeah, well, there's an, you know, the occasional quip from either side also helps. Uh, I, a few of them, yes, uh, I have. And, and I'd like to identify the Hamilton Sports Group because they took the Great Cup, which is a game and in, in activities, and turned it into a festival. A regional festival, Mr. Speaker. And the Great Cup isn't just about a party and a pregame party. It started in Hamilton on Wednesday night. And that experience went all the way through all the, to, to game time. There were player awards, and that regional piece meant we went to Niagara. And Niagara hosted Spots. a sport tourism summit that I'll talk about in a minute, but player awards, a concert afterwards, free shuttle service for people back and forth from Hamilton. Mr. Speaker, it was a great experience, and I'll tell you a bit more. Thank you, Thank you very much. Supplementary, back to the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. I understand that our minister has some experience winning Great Cups. It's encouraging to see the positive effects sporting events have on Ontario's tourism sector. Speaker, our tourism sector attracts visitors to the area boosts local businesses and creates jobs. Many people in my riding of Burlington rely on tourism for their jobs, and they have appreciated the various investments that saw them through times of lower attendance at their venues and activities. As we see the ongoing strength in Ontario's tourism, our government must continue to take the lead in supporting its development to unlock our province's true economic potential. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on our government's effort in building the tourism industry? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, again, thanks for the question. Uh, people are still talking about the 110 years around here. I just don't know. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I can't go without saying the, thanking the Mayor of Hamilton, the Chamber of Commerce, both in Niagara and Hamilton, for really stepping up and supporting sport tourism, because it was about a game, but it was about bringing people together. Uh, I think most people know, certainly football fans know, that CFL fans travel really well to the Great Cup across the country. Not just a couple hundred, but thousands and thousands from every market. And because of our support, CFL fans had a better experience this time, again, thanks to Hamilton Sports Group and the Chambers and everyone who were part of staging the Great Cup in Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it, I can't tell you how important it was to make a massive impact in the city, not about the game, not about just the day before, but the full week. The people of Hamilton benefited. The people Response. of the region benefited. Sport tourism is a big driver of our economy, especially on a national level. But let's not forget about the local hockey and football tournaments that travel around that support all our ridings, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. To the Minister of Colleges and Universities, Madam Minister, the other Frank Ontario who is a good. It's in the report on educa superior education, post college education. The Assembly of Francophonie in the University of Hearst and the University of French Ontario expressed in disagreement with the solutions offered by the report by the expert, Anglophone expert group. Institutions for, by, and f with Francophones. And my question for the Minister what means for you? for, with, and by. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for that question. And might I remind the member that this government, under the, pre the leadership of this Premier, has done more for Francophone education in Ontario than any other government. 
sure. we established not only one but two standalone francophone universities governed by and for francophones Here. the university de l'ontario francais and the university de hearst this year alone we provided 73 million dollars in dedicated funding that supported more than 320,000 post-secondary students enrolled in 381 French language and bilingual, bilingual language programs across the province. In fact, this fall, with my colleagues, the, Minister, the President of the Treasury Board, as well as the Minister of Education, we were thrilled to announce an additional 110 French language education spaces for the 2023-24 academic year, as well as standalone nursing programs for Boreal University College in Sudbury as well as Toronto. We are standing up for francophone education in this province. Thank you. And the supplementary question, the member for Nickelback. We do not uh, uh, want it for a question. We did not hear it. I have another question. In the 60s, an Anglophone group said we could not have a secondary school for Francophones. It was too expensive, but we have it. In the 80s, another Anglophone expert group said we could not have a, a Francophone college. It would be too expensive, but we have them. In the 90s, another group of experts said we could not have uh, school boards, Francophone school boards. It would be too expensive, but we have them. Then. A few weeks ago, an Anglophone uh, group of experts wrote to the minister that we could not have a Francophone university. It would be too expensive. What does the minister think? Mr. Apologies and University. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member again for that question. I have been clear, and the report also confirms, that the focus today needs to be on addressing existing institutions and programs and not on creating further du duplication in the sector. The long-term financial sustainability for our post-secondary institutions is a top priority moving forward. But as I mentioned before, the sustainability and viability of our sector is a shared responsibility, as was also stated in the report. And I have been clear that institutions need to review their spending and operating uh, operations for any increases in funding to be considered. We need to ensure that money is being spent wisely. My job as a minister is to ensure that post-secondary is viable for generations to come. And that is we are, what we are doing, and we are reviewing the recommendations and working with the sector currently. And I look forward to those continued conversations. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Mr. Speaker, let me start by wishing everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Safe Holidays. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. For four, far too long, seniors in Ontario were neglected by the previous Liberal government. More than 40,000 Ontarians, including my residents of Mississauga and Mills, left waiting for a bed, and they needed to wait an average of 123 days to be placed in a long-term care home. That's unacceptable, Speaker. Our seniors deserve a government that works for them and helps them live comfortably and with dignity. Our seniors deserve, uh, we must do all that we can to build more homes and more beds across all communities to create a better future for our elderly residents. Question. Speaker, can the minister please share with the House how our government is ensuring that seniors in Ontario are getting the quality of care and qual quantity, quality of life they need and deserve. Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. The member highlights uh, several important problems that our government inherited. And when you have a problem, you have to look at where that problem originated from and look, take steps towards fixing it. That's what this government did in 2018, Speaker. One of the problems the member highlights is a capacity issue. Under the last government, over 15 years, 611 net new long-term care spaces were built. Not nearly enough for a growing population, an aging population, with record immigration and seniors moving to this province. This government decided to do things differently, a $10 billion investment, the largest capital investment in this country's history, to build and upgrade 58,000 new spaces for our seniors. And that plan is bearing fruit, Speaker. In fact, I was just last month with that member in his riding to announce 160 new spaces in the Ivan Franco home, part of 18,000 spaces Spons. we have built 
or have shovels in the ground since 2018. We're going to continue to invest in our seniors. I want to thank that member and Merry Christmas to you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks for the Minister for this response. It is great to see our government deliver on the commitment to add more beds and upgrade existing homes of our elderly residents. Speaker, seniors currently compose 17.6 per cent of Ontario's population, and their share of the province's population will continue to grow. The Canadian Institute for Health Information reveals that over the next 20 years, seniors' population in Canada is expected to grow by 68 per cent. Our government must continue to address the growing numbers of aging Ontarians and their additional care needs. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is ensuring that every senior in Ontario Question. has fast and convenient access to the services they need? Mr. Long-term care. Uh, you know, Speaker, I heard it from the Premier for the first time, and I agree. I said it yesterday. I'll repeat it. Beds are furniture. We are building homes for our great seniors in this province. In fact, we are building 58,000 of them. But to make those homes, it has to be more than just the physical space. We have to talk about the health human resources. That's why this government is investing up to $1.25 billion for long-term care homes this year to hire, to retain thousands of hardworking frontline health care workers who do the job for our seniors that, frankly, many of us cannot do. Part of a larger plan of $4.9 billion to make sure we hire 27,000 PSWs, to hire thousands of nurses, to provide programs for those PSWs, for those nurses to scale up and to stay within the sector because we know that our seniors need them. In fact, by 2025, we're establishing a nation-leading standard of four hours of daily care per resident in our homes for our great senior speaker. Seniors built our country. We have to take care of them. Thank you very much. The next question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, families across this province are languishing on childcare wait lists because this government has yet at every turn refused to take steps required to address the workforce crisis. The YMCA of Greater Toronto Area has just 16,000 kids enrolled in its 35,000 spaces because they don't have the workers to staff them. Reports indicate that wait lists can be up to two years to get access to a space in the $10 a day child care program. The government's own experts say that Ontario could be short 8,500 ECEs by 2026. Workers say they can't afford to make a living working in childcare. Will the minister finally admit he needs to listen to experts, commit to a salary scale starting at $25 per hour for all childcare workers and $30 for RECEs to ensure the government can deliver on the promises to the spaces that the parents are waiting for their child cares to access? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I want to thank the Minister of Long-Term Care for this opportunity to speak today. Um, let's just take stock of where we're at. We came to office in 2018. Child care was prohibitive for so many families. It increased by 400 per cent under the former Liberal Party. This government comes to power. We cut fees by 50 per cent. We commit to build 86,000 spaces. We commit to a historic increase of salary for our hardworking ECs. And yes, we commit to go even further down to $10 a day. That is a record that is leaving a legacy of affordability for the working parents of this province that we all, as parliamentarians, should be proud of. We worked across party lines to do what's right, to enable higher rates of women's economic participation under the strong leadership of the Minister of Women's Economic and Opportunities. We're working together to make life affordable, to cut fees, increase spaces, and give hope to parents here, here. that they do not have to make a choice of raising their kids or working no longer in this province. That concludes our question period for this morning.